open up one box of cereal, you finish that box of cereal before you move on to the next one. And I wish uh, the, some of the officials here could take that, for Seam Reap, could take that same principle. You know, you start on one street, let's finish that one first, then we can move on to the next one. No, they've got the whole, all the streets torn up, and I'm sure it'll be great when they're finished, but. <laughs> okay, just one minute. Okay, so last time we left off in Hebrews chapter 12. And I really appreciate that song, God Will Provide. You know, God, God is in control. And we saw this morning with the, the message that Brother John gave us that, that uh, to Joshua and, and, and Israel, you know, God provided getting them through the Jordan. God is the one that provides to get, get us through the situations. You know, last year I think was a difficult year for, for a lot of people, you know, and yet God provided getting us through. Now, maybe he didn't necessarily split a river, okay, but God works in many different ways. You know, sometimes it's not in, an, in some miraculous, incredible way. You know, there, there was one time a captain of a ship and uh, he was going through the Pacific Ocean and a big storm came along and his ship got completely wrecked. Now he's a believer and, and he's floating there in the wreckage holding on to one of the wooden, wooden pieces. He prays to God. He says, God, please rescue me. Along came a local fisher boat just, just shortly after he prayed. And uh, they offered, you know, you want to come up and we'll take you back to, to land. And he said, no, no, uh, I'm good, you know. I'm good. My God's going to save me. My God is going to rescue me. And so he, you know, waited another couple hours and he prayed again. He said, God, please, God, I know you can rescue me. I know you can save me from this wreckage. And another boat came along. And a military ship came along, and they had, you know, offered him, hey, it will give you a ride to the mainland. So, no, no, I'm, I'm good. You know, no, it's, it's okay. God. My God, I believe my God will come and rescue me. A couple of days go by, and a couple more ships come by, and he, same thing, and finally he drowned. And he gets before God, and he says, God, I prayed, and why, why didn't you come and rescue me? Why didn't you come and pick me up from this wreckage. God looks at him and says, I sent you five ships. <laughs> Each time you prayed, I sent you another ship. You know, so sometimes, you know, God, he doesn't necessarily work in some way that, that's going to be like, okay, wow, you know, this was a miracle. Sometimes it can be real simple. Sometimes it can be a doctor. Sometimes it can be just something that God works in many ways. You know, so... You know, we, we shouldn't always expect, you know, some uh, miraculous thing necessarily. But yeah, this morning it was good to see, you know, the way that God rescued Israel. Okay, so moving on here to Hebrews. Uh, last time we looked at faith. We looked at how uh, the just shall live by faith. We saw in Hebrews 11... Um, how those who walked by faith and how uh, God delivered them and how they looked for another country. They looked for a better country and a better city. We also saw how we are to lift up each other and encourage each other. It says, lift up the hands that are fallen. Make straight the paths for the knees that are weak. We saw also about Esau. And we saw how Esau... Um, the, uh, who I believe from reading the scriptures that was a believer, yet he did not value his birthright, and so he lost the ability to be within the line of Christ. Okay, he lost privilege 
So we can be a believer, and, and the point here being that we can be a believer, but if we disregard the new covenant, we disregard the church, and we don't take part in this, we can miss out on the promises that are given only to the New Testament church, the privileges and the promises that come with that. Now, in this uh, morning, we're going to look at two mountains. We're going to look at two mountains. The one mountain we see is... Mount Sinai, okay, starting in verse number 18, chapter 12, verse number 18. And this, this is referencing to Mount Sinai. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mount, the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So what happened at that mount? This was referencing Mount Sinai. What happened there? Anyone? What did they receive at Mount Sinai? Yes, they got the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19, verse 10. We'll read about this mount. Exodus chapter 19, verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mountain, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount, toucheth the mount, shall be surely put to death. There shall not be in hand touch it. But he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. 
So we read about that mountain and we read in, in Hebrews that we're not come to that mount. We're not come to the mount where the, the law was given. A mount of fear, a mount of where, you know, death was what would happen if you touched that mount. Okay. But we are come to Mount Sion, verse number 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So we see a couple of groups given here that are at Mount Sion. So meaning that the time today, okay, is not the time of the law, right? The time today is the time of grace and mercy under Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. We're not under the, the law and under the, the condemnation and wrath of God at Mount Sinai, but we're under Mount Sion. We're under the blood of Jesus Christ. We here come to Mount Sion. And we see here there's groups, there are groups that are given. There are things that are given that are at Mount Sion. We see here that will come unto the city of the living God, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. We are come to an innumerable company of angels. We are also come to... Now, there, there's uh, verse 23. Let's take a look at verse 23. This is an interesting verse. Um, you actually have two groups uh, that are given here. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Going in the Greek, okay, there's, if you, if you actually um, go back and, and read uh, Greek documents going back all the way, Greek had been around for, for several centuries before the time of Christ, okay? So at this time, the language had been fully developed, and the words were well-defined. And the word ekklesia, this was a word, actually, it originates from Athens, okay? And if you go through and you read um, some of the documents from Aristotle, okay, dating back 300, 400 B.C., around that time, okay, you can actually read the Constitution of Athens. There's still, this document is still preserved to this day. In fact, at the time that Christ was here, you know, they all learned Koine Greek from the Roman Empire, okay? And they were taught Koine Greek, you know, in schools like we have today. So they had documents to refer to. And so these documents of, of, uh, the, from the Roman government, okay, about, um, about philosophy and about, uh, about the Constitution, about what the government exactly is and what the citizens are, all of these things, they were taught in schools, okay? So they had a well defined, understood meaning when Jesus said, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, in Athens, when you go through and you read the, the Constitution of Athens, you'll see that this word is actually used in this, this book, in this document, okay? It's used in many different documents from that time. Um, and it, it's used in reference to the citizens of the city-state. You know, they didn't have a, at that time in, in Athens, you, you had what was called a city-state. The government was a city government. There was no superior government than just that city government. And the citizens were the superior class within that city government. They would hire, they would uh, come together, they would meet and, you know, send, have representatives to, to go and ma handle various matters, but the citizens were very involved in the governance at that time. Okay? If you read through the, the Constitution of Athens, you'll see that it actually describes about how someone became a citizen once they reached a certain age, and how they would have an ecclesia come together 
people would be called, the, the actual word there, ecclesia, means to come, to be called out and gather, to assemble together. So they would form an ecclesia, called out, of the citizenry. It's specifically, it's specific to the citizens, those who had um, authority and had a certain right to be there, who were members of that city state. Okay? And so they would, they, they were, you know, paid taxes, and they, they were uh, people who were in good standing with the city-state, okay? So they would come together, and then, they, they, then someone reaches a certain age, they would go through a certain process to become a citizen of the city-state, okay? They had to be a citizen to be part of that ecclesia, to be able to have the authority to make decisions within that, okay? So when Jesus says this, I will build my church, my ecclesia, it had a well-defined meaning. It had a well-understood meaning at that time, meaning the citizens of that city coming out together to perform, to, to assemble and perform business relating to the city. Okay? But the other word here is to the general assembly. This is actually a different word. It's, it's uh, pane. Guris, panegurus. It's a conjugation of two words, just like ecclesia. It's a conjugation of two words. Pan, pas, means all, and guris means like the common place, the marketplace, and the streets. Because you see, in the city, you you had people who were citizens, and you had people who weren't citizens. Okay, so you had the people who were merchants who were coming to visit to sell things. Okay. So you have, this was also a kind of assembly, but it's a different kind, a contrast. This is the kind of assembly that involves everyone and anyone, all the people, okay? Panegurus, meaning that it's so that they had like big uh, games, you know. You would have a panegurus, an assembly of all the people coming to participate and see these games, okay? But it, they didn't have to be citizens to, to be part of that assembly, okay? So there's a contrast here, and the people understood at that time that there was a contrast between these two different words. When it says, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Okay, so I want you to see that contrast there. You see, when we become a believer, okay, we... It's not an end point. It's not a conclusion. It's not a conclusion of our faith when we become a believer. It's a beginning point. Then from there, we are to begin our walk of faith. Part of the walk of faith that, that Christ has given us is to be baptized and to join a church and to find the place in which we are to serve Christ through the New Testament church, through his ecclesia. Okay? And so that's, that's what I'm getting at here is that the word, I mean, it really it distinguishes the general assembly versus the church of the firstborn, okay? But they're all at Mount Sion. They're all at Mount Sion, okay? And it says here, um, to the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. In, in other words, God is the one who keeps track of whose part what churches are part of his churches? What churches? It's not for us to, to say, okay, look, let's look at all these churches and decide whether or not they're a church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Okay, because there are a lot of there are a lot of clubs out there. But you know, when we join a church, when we want to become a member of a church, our concern should be about our church that we are becoming a member of. That you know, we use our spiritual discernment to know, okay. Is, does, if I'm going to join this church, does this church belong to Christ? I mean, is this a church of Christ, or is this just a club? Is this just a group of people coming and meeting together? Does the Spirit of God dwell here? Do they follow sound doctrine? Do they follow baptism as is given in the scriptures? Are they, um, do they have the, the, the proper doctrine that's given in the Bible? So that's what we, when we should be concerned is when we're looking to join a church, and when we're a member of a church, you know, we should be concerned for each other. We should judge within. But those who are without, other churches, we're, God is the one who keeps track 
of who's, who is uh, part of the church of the firstborn, as it says, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now the word there, just men, is the, the word dikaios. Okay? And the word men there, it, it, it's not gendered. So it, it's men and women. Okay? And it's referring back to when we started in the Hall of Faith. We started reading in chapter 11. We saw... Um, Okay, one second. Where it says, and the just shall live by faith. Let me find where that is real quick here. Hebrews 4, 11.4. Going to Hebrews 11.4. Oh, sorry, no. Hebrews, let's go back to chapter 10, verse 38. So leading into the, the hall of faith, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And as it goes through here, this word is used when we're talking in the hall of faith. So when it's saying um, the spirits of just men made perfect, I believe that's referring to those who have gone before, who were part of, who weren't necessarily part of the new covenant because it didn't come yet until Christ came. But they had walked by faith. They have lived by faith, and God has certain promises for them. Okay, so we see that as a separate group here. Um, continuing in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse, so now referring back to Sinai, if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now this is actually referring to some verses in the Old Testament. And let's go, let's go ahead and... Uh, you see, back in the, if we, we, we looked at Exodus and about Sinai, the Hebrews knew that God on Sinai, that those who did not respect God's word and commandments could suddenly be killed. Okay, and let's go ahead and look at now Haggai chapter 2, 6 and 7. So we can see exactly what the author in Hebrews is referencing. Actually, we're going to start in verse. Um, we'll start in verse five. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not, for thus saith the Lord of hosts: Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory saith the Lord of hosts in, in, in continuing on actually let's go 8 and 9 the silver is mine and the gold is mine 
saith the Lord of hosts, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than, the, than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And let's also go to Ezekiel chapter 38. And go to verse 19. For my jealousy, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, <coughs> saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence, and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him in overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So what we're given here is that Let's say, let's say you leave out of the church, you decide to do your own thing, you decide to pursue your own wealth, your own pleasures, your own benefit, okay? And so you go and you do that, but you become the next Bill Gates. You become a billionaire, okay? And what I, what I want to tell you, and what Hebrews is saying here, is when Christ comes back, all of those things you just built, your entire kingdom that you just built for yourself, it's going to be gone. It's going to be destroyed. Those things that can be shaken will be utterly destroyed and wiped away. So all that time and effort will be for naught. Okay. And if we go to, let's go to Second Peter. Chapter 3, 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that these, that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, when the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Let's also go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And you know, it talked in Hebrews about the things that cannot be shaken. Talked about those things which can be shaken, right? The earthly things, the pleasures, all of these things will be destroyed. They will be burned up. They will be melted. But in, let's go to John chapter 10, 27 through 30. Jesus is speaking here. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 
and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So, when you got saved, if, you, if you're a believer here today, and, and you have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you've been born again, this is something that is eternal. It cannot be shaken. You could go and you could, let's say, live the rest of your life here, your temporary life, for yourself, for the flesh, and all that you build will be consumed. It will be destroyed. All that time and effort, gone. Yet your soul is in God's hands. But, you know, the warning here, though, is you'll miss out on things of the new covenant, promises given to the new covenant. So it's better that you spend the time here. Hebrews, he's speaking to the Hebrews. It's better that you spend the time devoted to the new covenant, devoted to the church, not going back to the old covenant, not going back to the law. Because the law, the, the tabernacle, that's why he refers back to, to those, those verses in Haggai and Ezekiel. That's going to be destroyed. It's going to be gone. There's going to be a new tabernacle. There's going to be a new temple. There is a new temple in the heavens. There will be a new Jerusalem. So you go and you spend, let's say they, these Hebrews went back and they spent all this time, you know, going to the feasts, involved in the, the old covenant and worship again. All that's going to be gone. It'll be a waste of time, and they'll miss out on the blessings and the promises within the new covenant. Okay, so going back to Hebrews, let's go to chapter 13. And we'll continue. Yeah, we'll continue from there. <coughs> but yeah, I do just want to emphasize that you know, he's, the author is very clear that the things which can be shaken will be uh, will not remain anymore. They will be removed. But the things which cannot be shaken will remain. So if you're a believer, your soul is secure. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. <coughs> when, uh, when I was a young, young child, there was a time, uh, one, one of the years, where my parents were having some serious difficulties with the finances. And uh, there, there was always this, this one lady who walked around the, the neighborhood, and we called her the bag lady. She was kind of an older lady, and she had these, you know, all these bags that looked like their clothes were really kind of raggedy and torn, and, and you just kind of thought, you know, no one knew where she lived. I mean, when you ever you see her, you just kind of look the other way because it's just like you just ignore, you just ignore her, right? And uh, but yeah, one winter we were having just kind of a difficult time. Um, my my parents were having a difficult time with the finances, and you know my mom didn't have money to buy food. Okay, and on our doorstep, and it was snowy winter. You know, it was like snow outside left on our doorstep from the bag lady. Big bag of food, bread, and a lot of other things. How'd she know? You know, and, and looking back, I almost wonder, you know, was that, was that an angel? You know, you never know. Someone that, you know, you think, well, this person looks, looks by worldly standards to be, you know, just refuse, you know, just eventually they're going to die off, right? But it turns out, well, who knows? I mean, that, that person could have very well been an angel sent by God to look out over people, look out over us. So, yeah, 
you know, be, be kind to strangers, be kind to people that, that look unacceptable by the world's standards. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. So those who are in persecution because of the, the gospel. We're very fortunate in this time that we don't face that. But, you know, there could become a time soon where we do. And we will need to remember those who are within bonds. And then which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversations. And that, that word there, uh, the, them that have the rule over you, it's the word hegeomai. Those who, who lead, the, the word generally is used for those who lead or command or judge. The word, one of the, the conjugations of it is ago, which means to carry. So those who have the role in the, the church to, to help carry those who um, are not is who, who are, are spiritually immature, okay, to help those along that saying to them, you know, remember them which have the rule over you, and those who helped carry you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. You know, Peter, or Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If at any point Paul stopped following Christ, then, you know, they should not follow Paul right? Follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Now this is a really interesting verse because the word in place where it says the same, actually this word is autos and it, it's the kind of word if you were to say, um, okay, so uh, Let, let's say that, you know, pastors, uh, his, if I'm talking about the pastor, I'm saying his wife, okay? Meaning that, you know, this belongs, this is his wife, belongs to him. Or if I said, okay, Brother Jong's phone, okay? His phone, okay? This phone belongs to Brother Jong, okay? And that's the word that's used here. It's his, Jesus Christ. His yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning that it's kind of a strange thing to say. I mean, normally that would be a strange thing to say. Saying that yesterday belongs to him. Today belongs to him. And forever belongs to him. That the time of the past, of the present, and the future all belong to him. That's what that that verse, when I read that in the, the Greek, is what it's conveying, is that time, yesterday, today, forever, all belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen? Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have no, not profited them, but have been occupied therein. And what he's, what he's talking about here, not being carried away with diverse doctrines, um, it can be, you know, referring to uh, making doctrines of self-righteousness of, of, you know, at that time, uh, they were, the, the Hebrews were trying to figure out, okay, because they just left the Old Covenant, what should we be able to eat? What should the Gentiles who joined the church be able to eat? Should they be able to eat pork? Should they be able to eat something that is offered up to idols? 
Should they, if, if they don't know if it's offered up to idols, should they be able to eat? So they were getting into all these questions about, you know, what should we, when he says meats here, what should they be able to eat? Should they still go back and, and engage in the feasts of the temple? So these were all questions that were, were coming up at that time. And, you know, the Hebrews, a lot of them were very critical of others in this matter. We were trying to judge, you know, okay, well, you're a Gentile, and you're, you're going out and you're eating with these other people. Do you know if that food was sacrificed to idols before you ate it? Okay. So they were saying like this, and we could see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go ahead and go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 through 33. It says, uh, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, eat that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? For that for which I give thanks. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all things to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So we should do all things in faith and unto, you know, consideration for, okay, is this going to create a problem for the, the non-believer? Is this going to create a problem for them? But, uh, you know, the the point that he's getting is to not get into these doctrines, these diverse doctrines about making a bunch of rules and, and laws and, and things for people within the church to say, well, you can do this, you can't do that, you can do this. Let's make, you know, a bunch of restrictions on whether, when you can go to a meal with someone else. Because, you know, they came out of the Old Covenant and these Hebrews, they, they were, it's easier if I can judge your faith by the clothes you wear and by the things that you do, it's easier if, if I don't have to use spiritual discernment and I can just look at you and, oh, you, you look dressed nice. You must be a good Christian. You know? uh, so this is kind of what he's getting at is let's not make doctrines out of things that are um, concerning the, the physical, but you know, let's use spiritual discernment and faith. And uh, continuing on here, for we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat. This is verse 10. Sorry, Hebrews 13, 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat. Who has no right to eat? The, the priests of the tabernacle, the Levitical priests, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own, with his own blood, suffered without the gate, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name 
but to do good and to communicate forget not for with such sacrifices God is well pleased so what are the sacrifices that God is pleased with we see here that you know the better sacrifices than going back to the temple and offering sacrifices it's better that we give God the sacrifice of praise of thanksgiving that we do good to others that we have charity to others that we take care of those who are in his church and you know Jesus said what you do for the least of these you do unto me right in um, I think that's Matthew chapter 7 let's go there Matthew chapter 7 verse Sorry, Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So if you want to know how you can serve Christ, the way you can serve Christ is looking around within the church and seeing how you can be a blessing to others by serving the brethren and sisters in the church this is how you can directly serve Christ helping those who are in need not just for the not just helping like okay well I'm gonna you know do something for the pastor or do something for the deacons or someone who's very strong in the church and already has that really doesn't need the help but finding someone who is ignored, someone who is not, uh, who is looked over and, and maybe who is in need, who looking out for each other means not just looking to the, the people that um, are the most prominent in the church, but means to looking for those who, who have the most need and have being a blessing to them. How can you help them? And then uh, we get to verse 17, going back to Hebrews. Um, 13 verse 17 obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you so the pastor here you know he he is a hireling to watch the flock to look out for Christ's church here and you know we need to we need to listen you know when he's teaching us and and whenever whenever even brother Jong or brother Alex or when when they're giving a message out of the word of God using spiritual discernment we should listen and take heed and use these these teachings to help us in our walk with Christ because you know they're doing it for your benefit they're doing it for your growth pray for us so verse 18 pray for us for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly but I beseech you the rather to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever amen and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy, I, I think that's just funny when he says that in verse 22. He says, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Okay, we've been on Hebrews for how many months now? Just a few words, right? <laughs> so, yeah, they, they had a sense of humor at least. Huh? He's a pastor, yeah, sure. 
Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute, that means give a greeting. Greet all of them that have the rule over you and all the saints. That's that same word too before, that same word hege, hegeomai um, that we talked about before, those who carry. Um, salute them that have the word over you and all the saints. Now the word there, the saints, okay, if you go through and you do a study in the New Testament about this word saints, which is, the word is hagio, uh, this word means set apart, something holy, set apart for the purpose of God, okay, someone who has been sanctified for God's purpose, okay, it is never used in reference to someone who's dead. You know, the Catholic Church uses saint to reference someone who's already dead that they can pray to, to intervene on their behalf. But no, that's, you will never find in the New Testament, I've studied this, you never, you can do it yourself. Study, find every time where you see this word saint. Every single time it is in reference to people who are alive and serving in Christ's New Testament church. Okay? Yeah. We're members in Christ's New Testament church. So he says, um, salute all the saints. Greet all of them. They of Italy salute you. They, they greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay, and so the entire point, we've finally come to the end of the book of Hebrews. Okay. And what, what do you guys... Well, what are some of the things you took away from this book? I mean, what is something that you learned going through this? Anyone? The, uh, the new covenant is much better, superior to the old covenant. Amen. And that we are in a better position, having all of these promises than those given in the first covenant. So yes. Yes. One of the things that I've gotten from going through the book of Hebrews here in this study is, uh, you know, the, our salvation is not a conclusion. It's not an end point. It's, it's a beginning point. That when we get saved, it's not the conclusion. It's the beginning. Born again, you know, it's a birth into, in, into the Christ. And it is a beginning of our walk of faith. Meaning that if you go through and you read this entire book of Hebrews, it's directed to people who are believers. It's giving them instruction on what to do after you're saved. What, th th these are actually not just believers, these are believers who are in the new covenant and how they are to continue on. So, you know, getting saved is just just our first, that first step of faith, but it's only a beginning, you know, and, and we have a responsibility after we get saved to, to get baptized and join a, a New Testament church. And then, then that's also just the beginning because now we have a responsibility to learn where our part is in this church, what our, our role is, what, where, does, where can we best serve Christ, how can we best serve Christ on a day-to-day -day basis. How can we be part of this church and for the glory of God? Amen. Amen. 
So yeah, getting saved is just the beginning. But we have a lot of opportunities to take part in a lot of privileges that God would have for us. And that can also mean in the ever after that there may be privileges that we have that we otherwise would not have had if we didn't take part in the new covenant. Okay. Now, the, the Bible is clear on what some of those are, and it's also, it seems, you know, a bit, well, some of it's given in parables. If you, we go back and read, we read through some of Christ's teachings of what all that means in the ever after to be part of his church. Okay, but there is a big, I, I can see here that, you know, there's a big warning for those who would go back to the old covenant or those who would go back to their old life who have been saved and have been redeemed. There is a warning that you will miss out on a great deal. You, you may be saved and your, your soul is in God's hand, but you may miss out on a lot of promises like Esau missed out on having that birthright, having the, being part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you.